2019 world champion. I think Coach Megan sent out a bio to everybody. But just to run through it quickly, and for those who may not have read it, Zane, a gifted high school swimmer, represented South Africa at the Youth Olympic Games. He went to the University of Alabama, an NCAA Division I program. He swam under Jaunty Skinner, who was the second man to break 50 seconds in the 100 freestyle, I believe. A little bit of swimming history there. And he raced Caleb Dressel often enough. He started by making finals at his conference championships. He progressed to an NCAA championship and eventually a world championship individually, which is pretty cool. Not many people get to uh, claim that when they're done swimming. So without further ado, Zane Waddle. Zane, hey, is there it? anything I didn't cover in that bio? No. I think you got it all. It's nice to be here. I'm looking forward to chatting to you guys. Is this, uh, is this your first time doing one of these? I didn't ask you that. I think it is. Okay. You got the luck. Yeah. So from here on out, you'll be doing uh, paid promo only. <laughs> um, before we get into the swimming stuff, do you have any hobbies outside swimming that consume enough of your time to be worth mentioning? Uh, I guess I play quite a few video games. Um, I enjoy PC games most. So that's probably what takes up majority of my time outside of something. That and schoolwork. Well, I suppose you're done with school now, but yeah, when it was school. Um, we won't talk too much about the high school stuff, but could you start by telling us why you decided to move from South Africa after being done high school swimming there to Alabama? Yeah, I think it's very important. One of the big reasons I did move over was because I was looking for the opportunity to pursue an academic career alongside a swimming career, which I think um, is important for a lot of people. <laughs> um, so to be able to do that concurrently and have the, like, all the facilities that the NCAA institutions here have, um, that, there was no way that I couldn't make the move from South Africa to the USA. And then why Alabama was because of John T. He was a coach there at the time. Um, and he's obviously South African. So there was a South African connection there. Nice. Yeah, the, the resources are pretty incredible at, at universities for swimming, especially in the US and the Southeastern Conference. The Southeastern Conference is incredibly competitive so the the floridas the georgias the alabamas the tennessees all produce incredible swimmers from caleb dressel to zane here with us what would you say was the biggest difference or were there a number of them coming from south africa and moving to the ncaa level of competition for myself especially moving from south africa it was um there was a big change in the competition I had during training and at meets. Um, I think what a lot of people experience coming to the U S is that if you go to meet you, you're usually the best swimmer at the meet, or you are usually the best swimmer in your training group. Um, and then to come to a place like the Alabamas, the Floridas, the, uh, the Tennessees, um, then you're all of a sudden surrounded by the best swimmers from their respective hometowns all in one place. And to have that competition is, uh, it really, can enhance your swimming to the next level. Um, and another big change, especially for coming from South Africa was the facilities we had. Um, when I was back home, I had a, a long course 50 meter pool uh, that was outdoors year round. So no matter if it was negative five outside or 45 outside, we'd be swimming in that pool. Wasn't very heated. Uh, they still used that or they still use coal to heat it. So, uh, the facility change was awesome coming to the U.S. So I think the first part of your answer there touched on the level of competition being higher in training. What was it like being the absolute best and then getting beat, if not consistently, at least once in a while at practice? It was refreshing. It's refreshing. Um, me as a very competitive person, I enjoy that. Uh, when you come and then you have the likes of Robert Howard and Christian Golomiev uh, just beating you every day in practice, I think it pushes you to become a better swimmer. Um, it teaches you a new way to approach the sport. And um, 
yeah it's just super competitive and it will bring the best out of you if you go into it with the right mindset for for reference zane's best times i converted them to from short course yards which is what he competed in in the ncaa to short course meters and i think all three of these would be canadian records or close to them a 21-0 in the 50 free a 48-8 in the 100 backstroke and a 45-5 in the 100 freestyle, which is pretty quick. And to be clear, you did not win with what those times convert to in all three of those events when you competed at the SECs. But you were close, but that's what it takes to be competitive at that level. So you were consistently being pushed to that level and further by the, the people you mentioned. And that leads into the next point and question. When we swam together, you beat me at sprint sets, but you also beat me at distance sets. You were as pure a sprinter as they come. And yet on the mornings when the whole team was doing a 3000 for time or 20 by 500 or 3100's best average, you were in lane one leading the fastest interval, holding a fantastic time throughout the set. Why was that important to you, even though you were a, a pure sprinter doing only 50s and 100s at competitions? I think it's important because uh, either way you look at it, you can bre- so you have swimming and you can break it into, you have sprint, middle distance and distance, but at the end of the day, it's all swimming. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's good to go in with a mindset, especially if you're going to the long, like 3,000 four times. Um, we did the, the, the 2,500s at one stage when we were swimming on training trip and i think um it was just very important to go in with the mindset that this is going to help me it's going to help me build a, uh, an aerobic base that i eventually need to go fast in the pool um but it was a it is a grind there's no which or what way about it but um it's all about the mindset you go into it with and um that way you can make it a slightly more enjoyable if you don't enjoy those those type of sets Okay, so starting off with the right attitude can make all the difference in the world. That's what I'm hearing there. Is there a specific set you can point to that maybe you remember being a little negative going into and kind of checking yourself back into the attitude that you knew you needed? Absolutely. So trending trip, I'm going to touch back on it. Um, the, we did a 2,500 set for charity. Uh, Christian was there. He can attest to it. Um, me and Bob were going in and it was the last thing I wanted to do on a, I think it was a Thursday morning. We just had a hard week of training. Um, my body was sore. It's sunny outside. I'm probably too dehydrated for my own good, but going into that, the first couple 500s were tough, maybe the first three. So when I hit the 1500 mark, I, I told myself I've still got in like another 17 to go. So it's time to get yourself in check. And that way you just make it a little bit more enjoyable. It makes a set a lot easier when you have that positive mindset of going into it. Um, this is what I have to do to get done, to get better. And yeah, it just made, we finished the set. Um, I couldn't feel my arms or my legs or my stomach, but it was, um, it's definitely something that I can say I've done 2,500s before. Yeah, that that's a memorable set for sure. When, you're done something so difficult, so long, especially in that case. Do you do any kind of reflection on what you've just accomplished? I do. And to this day, I still look back. I'm like, okay, this set is pretty hard, but I did those 2,500s two years ago. So I can definitely do this. This is nothing in comparison to those 25s or 31s um, or 5K medley set. Whatever you've done that you found really difficult at that point, and you look back, maybe you're going, you're doing it. another 31s. You're like, oh yeah, 31s. That's nothing in comparison to 25s. So I can kick this and uh, get this done quick, you know? Right. Fair enough. So on the other end of the spectrum, how do you approach a set that is in your wheelhouse? A bunch of 25s to get a broken hundred time. What what do you think about before? Because you get given workouts beforehand, and this year we're doing that, where the swimmers get to see what they're about to do. When you're given that workout ahead of time, what comes to mind as you go through the set? As I go through the set, I look at what the main objective is of the set. So it's very important to 
either look at it and figure it out what the what your coaches are trying to get you to do or i'm sure all the coaches are open to explaining as to why you're doing the sort of workout and i find that very important is to find out why you're doing that work just makes it a lot easier to handle and it gives you someone to focus on so if, if i'm doing a broken hundred uh 20 by like 25 um i take each 25 one at a time and i really focus on what i would be doing at the race so like let's say i dive in for the first 25, I'd be focusing on executing the perfect dive and the perfect first 25 of seven, seven, six strokes, hit my underwater kicks, hit the breakout. And then I'm done with that 25. Then I look at the next 25. What should I be doing at this stage of the hundred? And it goes through each 25 like that, where I'm building on top of each 25 and how I would like the perfect race to be swam. Right. So there's a lot of thinking going on in practice for sure. Would you say that that amount of thinking consistently throughout practice makes a swim meet easier and more thoughtless or what's your approach like at a meet? Is it automatic or do you still have that same kind of routine? Yeah. So thinking during training is very important. Um, uh, that's how John used to explain it. You would have to think in training to not think during the races. Um, so you always got to be mindful of what you're doing in the pool. Um, you're going to just waste your time if you're in the pool, just swimming up and down mindlessly, not really focusing on anything. So I find it very important to focus on every little detail I can at that time during practice. And then when I approach meets, I know I've programmed my brain to be able to execute all those little things I've been spending hours focusing on in the training pool and just be able to do it through muscle memory um there goes there's quite a lot of thinking that goes in towards the beginning of a race when you walk out i find it very important to walk out confidently you have to believe in yourself you have to believe in the training you've done um but the moment you either get on top of the blocks or get into the water for the backstroke start um i think then your mind you supposed to go on autopilot where you've spent hundred thousand hours in the training pool um, focusing on the little details, whereas now you have to focus for 20 or not focus, give it over to your automatic systems for the next 25 seconds and then just execute it the way you've trained. Right, right. I like that. When you talk about programming, I'm thinking just being aware of every part of your body while you're doing things like drills or easy swimming, developing good habits, building on, on what you know based on what your coaches tell you. Do you have any favorite drills for each stroke or just for backstroke or freestyle for, for working on specific things? Yeah, so I like doing, so for fly, um, I, do, I enjoy doing slow fly with like a finger trip drag. Um, I find that very good in focusing on lifting my elbows, initiating the stroke, getting a good catch. For backstroke, um, just swimming backstroke for me, uh, there's not really a specific drill. The backstroke in and of itself is a stroke where you can feel everything that you're doing, the rotation uh, of your kick, of your torso. Um, and for freestyle, one of my favorite ones, because, because I swim so much straight arm free, it's refreshing to do high elbow free. So to do finger trip drag with a high elbow, brings me back to that more traditional freestyle stroke uh, where I can focus more on my catch under the water and my rotation, my connection between my hands and my feet. Yeah. And I guess we'll touch a little bit more on the backstroke specifically because next I wanted you to walk us through a race, not just the swimming part of it, but the start, the walkout, what you're thinking about behind the blocks. And I think you're going to, be able to share your screen with everybody and we'll walk through a pretty important race, the NCAA championship. So it's the United States university system for swimming. And it's probably the deepest level of competition in the world. It's the second or third fastest meet in the world, I'd say. And it is hard to win at, at that level. So you guys had a pretty good relay. You let off with the backstroke. And I think that uh, you walking us through every part of that race that you can remember would be especially helpful. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can pull it up. 
here. Share screen, sorry. Okay, I don't know, can you guys see that? Good. All right, so we have the, 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 this is the Mated Relay, you'll see we are, can you see my mouse? Is my mouse on the screen? Um, yeah, so we'll be here right in lane four. You have me, that's Robert Howard, that's Lou Bams from the Netherlands, and uh, that's Knox. So initially we were behind this tent in the, in the, when we were walking out, and we were in a group. Um, Robert Howard was giving us his motivational speech that he does every time. Um, had something to do with Alabama football, I'm not really sure. Um, but he was the hype guy for us. And I remember walking out because you see everyone here, like this is Coleman Stewart, Justin Race right over there. Um, these guys are world-class swimmers. And I walking out, each and every guy in that relay, me, Bob, uh, Lou, and Knox, we're all super focused, confident. We, we went into this race with the objective of winning. So I'm going to see if I can play here. I'm not sure how the sound's going to sound like, but. So that's Cal. Texas is over there. Tennessee, uh, NC State, all huge schools that Louisville's right over there. Um, so, yeah, let's see. So what you saw right there was just kind of a textbook my my backstroke start isn't one of the best and you can see there's a little bit more splash around mine than let's say Coleman Stewart who he is a little bit of a smaller guy um so he's going to have a little bit less splash um but this isn't the perfect dive uh but I did have quite a good start and we'll see when we we break out Coleman's excellent underwaters he probably had the best underwaters in this field <laughs> So you're going to see, it's a little blurry now, but what I want you guys to watch out for in the next five seconds is how early I initiate. So I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but it's check how early I will initiate my turn movement, that backstroke turn movement in relation to uh, the guy to my left and to my right. Um, so I'm going to go back about five seconds. John see, I initiated mine right there. This guy is still turning on his back. The cow guy is still turning on his uh, stomach. Um, all these guys are slow. And that, I think that's very important. And that's something we worked on uh, for, the pre, for the whole of the season was initiating that early backstroke turn. Um, and it's something innovative that John T. Skinner was kind of trying to work on was the timing on the, of the backstroke. Because everyone knows how to do a backstroke turn, but how to do it fast is that's where you win a race. So we're going to play this turn. Morning, Look at the difference. This guy, we turned it around the same time. This is Coleman Stewart. We turned around the same time. This guy lost it for his team over there. Uh, this guy's popped up already, and we turned at about the same time at the 25. So that's all with one turn. And this is something important that everyone needs to understand in swimming is the turn is, is the most useful weapon you have in short course yards, short course meters and in the hundred of long course meters uh, because you only have one you have to make the most use of it so we'll finish it out and that was that i think that that was 20.4 so it wasn't quite my best 50 back um i had a better 50 back at the secs um but that was just something that to look at the the stroke rate going into the last 15 um is where I started pulling away a little bit more post turn. This is Zay one L of Alabama at 20 points. There we go. Um, so that was the backstroke portion. I'm sure if you guys have any questions about the, the, the technicalities of that race, you can just leave it in, I think, in the chat box. Um, but that was it. So very important, short course yards, short course meters, um, is that turn. 
And that is something that won us this race. If, if we go through the rest of the race, you'll see that everyone's turns, especially Robert Howard's on the freestyle, um, is phenomenal. So we're going to go. 0.41 followed by Coleman Stewart at 20.66. So something interesting was, so Lou Bams actually came in as a backstroker for the University of Alabama. And um, he made the transition to breaststroke in the last maybe six months leading up to this. So him doing this breaststroke was phenomenal. But if we move forward to the freestyle where you'll see it a little bit better. So as you can see, everyone dove in at the same time. That's Ryan Hoffer, fastest guy in the 50 short course yards right now in the, in the whole United States, in the whole world, I would think. But besides Caleb Dressel, if he had to come back short course yards. And what we're going to watch here again is, is he's turned to short course yards. This is at So you see, he started his turn already. They haven't started. Um, the Texas guy hasn't even started. And you will see Bob's already almost halfway submerged. There's Ryan Hoffer. I think he was a little bit ahead in this. So he had started his turning motion. This is Jackson, Alabama, Robert Howard, NC State, Justin Ress. And out of nowhere, in lane two, here comes California. And again, finishes. There's no one better at finishing a race than Robert Howard or Christian Golomiev, probably Caleb Dressel. And this finish, as you can see, that's Ryan <laughs> Hoffer. Um, this is the NC State guy, Niels Constantia. And this is Robert Howard. And they're basically, you might, it's maybe half a centimeter, maybe half a millimeter between these guys. And that finish is very important. So that's the crux of the story um the backstroke uh, especially short course yards short course meters underwaters turns something that you can work on in training is that early turn um is try and play around with the timing of the turn if you wait too long you're going to be way too close to the wall it's better to be a little bit further away from the wall in order for you to get that maximum effective pop off the wall and uh yeah i'm glad i could walk you guys through that i've never actually gone through and um i i mean i've watched the race before but i haven't technically gone through and you know kind of break it down it's it's a short race that was 20 seconds worth of race um so yeah well you did a fine job doing it but i I like what you said about initiating the turn before the person next to you, because it's not like when you flip over, you stop moving toward that wall. So why not flip over, keep moving, submerge and get in. I, I, I like the emphasis there. Before we get into, I don't know if Coach Megan has received any other questions. I don't see any in the chat here yet. But so if you all have any questions, make sure that you send them to us in the chat. I did want to ask some academic questions. You had a near perfect GPA and that's with 30 hours of swimming commitments per week. That's almost a full-time job's worth of committed hours every week. And yet uh, I know you found time to do not just the work that needed to be done to get by, but that and then some. You were normally the best student in your class. Professors knew your name and remembered you. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your process throughout a week for managing your time and i wondered if you could tell us what it's like to go through an entire school year with that kind of time commitment looming over you yeah so i think it's a very important thing and it's something you learn early on in in your college experience late high school experiences um time management you learn very quickly that you don't have that much time to uh, certain computer games during the week, um, certain Xbox games, but it's also about like when I got, so a normal day would be, um, I very rarely have morning training. So I'd either have weights or sleep in, go to class, um, come back from class and, uh, go to training 
And then straight off the training, I'd either head to a coffee shop or I'd head to the library or I'd go meet up with a group project. And it's about being very efficient with your time after swimming training, before swimming training, in between classes, I made sure to bring whatever books, laptop, uh, calculators, just whatever I needed to get homework done, maybe in the 30 to 45 minutes between class, I try and do that. Um, but it's all about time management. It's about learning how to manage your time. Um, you have a lot of time on the weekends. On My Sundays were usually packed with academic work, uh, trying to get ahead for the week, studying for exams and stuff like that. Um, but it's all about managing your time. That's a very important part of the college experience, especially as a student athlete, even in high school. Um, high school is vastly easier, um, but you start learning those aspects of time management with the amount of swimming you guys are doing. Do you have any habits or tools that help you manage your time really well? Yeah. So, uh, my girlfriend got me a planner and that changed my life um, to be able to physically see it. Um, I would meet up with Christian at Starbucks. We'd go and uh, do some homework there. We'd work on our respective stuff. Um, but a habit of mine is to write down, is to plan out the week on a calendar. Or So I have a big calendar to the side here, actually. I still do it, even though I have no homework. It's become so much of a habit. But I got myself one of these, one of these guys has all the days I have everything I have you guys right there. Um, so to plan that out and have like everything visualized for me. Um, and then I, I have a smaller notebook that I keep everything I have to do for when I'm walking around or going to class, I have that sort of stuff written down in a planner. Um, so I can just visualize it and see where I have time, where I don't have time. We have to make time to eat. Um, and that's, a huge habit for me that probably got me through college. And this all sounds like a lot and it sounds ominous, but your GPA was actually the norm on the team. So would you say that being a student athlete and committing that much time to your sport while you've got to focus on your studies, because that, as you said earlier, comes first, would you say that that made you better as a student yeah no for for sure i mean just my one of my first few weeks on campus um the team captain at the time carlo he came out to me and he said yeah we take academics very seriously so there's that aspect of peer pressure towards being good academically um because obviously if you're on a college team if you're on a high school team if you're swimming in general you're probably competitive and you don't want to have the worst gpa on the team um, because people will find out and know. Um, but being a student athlete, that teaches you stuff that normal people or non-athletic people don't really have, you know? You have a certain drive, you have a certain competitiveness, and you always want to be the best that you want to be, which is very important. And it's something you can't forget about because something important that my mother always told me was um, you have to have a fallback. You can't swim forever. Uh, you might blow out your shoulder or something like that. Um, thankfully it, it hasn't happened, but it's always good to have a plan B plan C. Um, it's always very important to have that. And I think academics is, well, it's also a perfect outlet for, um, if you, so when you're not swimming, you have to have something else to focus on. And that was academics for me. So I have my first question from the audience, Zane. I'll just read it directly. What are your vices? How do you deal with stress and worries during school and before a race? So how do I deal with that stress? Something very important. That's something that the previous coaching staff put us through was vision pursue. Uh, I still use it. Christian knows it. Um, so it's like the, it's this app where you practice meditation, mindfulness, um, expanding your A, which is just sort of, as sort of a metaphor for being living in the moment um, and meditation helps me being relaxed, but also staying focused on the bigger picture where I'm trying to go keeps me on path and motivated to do what I need to do to get there. I think if I recall correctly, expanding your A is something like 
your goal is to get from A to B, but don't forget about A, work on being in the moment. And that touches back to what you said about doing a broken swim, focus on the 25 that you're doing, not the next one or even the whole thing, but where you're at in the moment, because it makes things a lot easier for sure. Exactly. How did, I'm not sure if there's one big change or an aha moment that you had, but what was it that led to such a big drop? Because you were a youth, a youth Olympic Games swimmer, but I'm pretty sure that you didn't make a final when you went, or you had a swim off and maybe snuck into a final, but then you won world. So obviously there was a huge drop in time. Was there a point or an aha moment or something like that that you could tell us about? I don't think it was so much a, an overnight thing. Like I just thought, yeah, I want to be good at swimming. Now I'm good at swimming type of thing. Um, it, was, it was definitely years in the making. Um, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. So I was showing up to practice every day with a good attitude. Um, I was listening to all my coaches throughout my swimming career. Um, I was being a positive teammate. I was supporting my teammates. Um, I was at the meets, always having spirit. Um, so it was more of a slow build up to everything. And it all just, I guess, the floodgates kind of got released last summer when I started winning everything. Um, but it was definitely years in the making, all the hard hours, all the hard yards, um, being a good teammate, teammates being positive towards me. Um, it was all just a, a big build up. Right. You, you spent a few years coming second a lot and then now, now you're winning, but as you said, it wasn't overnight. I'm wondering, uh, while I wait on any other questions that people might have, I'm wondering if there is a best way to give you feedback personally. What is the best way that you learn at practice? My, my best way is, um, so I do like a little bit of intensity in training, um, but it's very important for the coach or who, 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 whoever has us at the moment is to explain why we're doing something um, because it gives me something to work on and it's, it gives me something to hone in. Um, I am a, a, a kinetic learner, a learn by movement type person. So I'll play around with the drill a lot. Uh, I will mess it up the first couple 25s we do it or the first couple hundreds we do it. I will mess up the drill, but I'll be playing around with it, figuring it out um, and how best I can do it because everyone's body is different. Everyone's going to do things slightly different. Um, so just to find out the best way for myself to do it is, is the way I learn best. Nice. Yeah. Right. So making sure that you're present at all times is the only way to be able to toggle the drills back and forth. This one is a little bit outside the pool, but how did you deal with the postponement of the Olympics? How did you reset after they postponed the Olympics? Yeah. So um, obviously with coronavirus and everything happening, um, it was very important for me to put myself in the best possible position. So Olympics was canceled. It was the right decision because I mean, everyone like this thing isn't a joke. Um, but to just put myself in the best possible position to stay fit. So we were, um, I was running, doing dry land workouts, um, just doing everything to keep my mind off of that. Whoa, it's actually been postponed like a whole year. But in the reality of things, it's only like half a year away now again. So we're, getting back up to it. And um, we started to train harder again towards that. Fair enough. Yeah. So it was just about staying in touch with the sport as best you can, but otherwise keeping fit and a good attitude throughout. Exactly. How old were you when you started swimming? I don't think I asked that. Huh? How old was I? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Uh, obviously, we did water safety lessons. Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, probably grade five or five, maybe grade five or grade four. I'm not sure. Okay. I, th I think in Canada, that's actually probably a, a late start. I'm, I'm not sure what the average start is, but that sounds like a late start. So that's pretty impressive. When you are 
standing next to a heat full of champions, Olympians, conference champions, the best swimmer from wherever they came from, as you were in that NCAA final. Is there anything you remind yourself of, or do you have blinders on? What, what do you tell yourself to stomach the butterflies when you're standing shoulder to shoulder with the Caleb Dressels? I think something I told myself before that 50 back and something I've been telling myself lately and even prior to that 50 back was why can't I win it? I mean, I was training with the best in every day of the week, uh, week in and week out. So the biggest thing that I was always telling myself was why can't I win it? There's absolutely no reason why I can't win it. When you pointed out Coleman Stewart, the NC State backstroker, you mentioned that he was a little bit smaller, but I'm pretty sure he touched second or third. So obviously his team was in the mix. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes body composition important, but not everything in the sport? Yeah, so I'm trying to think how I could relate this. Um, so you, everyone has their genetics. I mean, LeBron James, he's genetically a freak. Caleb Dressel, genetically a freak. He could be a little bit taller, and that's where it comes in. You have Caleb Dressel, he has the perfectly sized to ratio, legs to torso, arm length, all that. But it's not everything because anyone can do that, if, if you think about it. Caleb Dressel, every, he was probably told day in and day out, you're too short, you can't be a sprinter, and you're not – Six, 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 seven. Frederick Bousquet type height, length, weight, um, and I think he's under two hundred pounds as well. He's not this big, heavy guy, so it does play a role with the genetics of it. Obviously, you have to have the talent. You have to have height, weight. You got to look like a sprinter, or you got to look like a distance swimmer, or something. But it's not everything. Um, I'm trying to think of that. The there's a mission guy, Vargas. Doesn't, he looks more sprinter than he does a 1,500-mile guy, and he kills everyone in the mile. So it plays a slight role, but it's not something that should hold you back from achieving your goals and everything you want to achieve. Right, because when you were at Worlds, you probably weren't the tallest swimmer in the pool and definitely not the tallest swimmer in the 50s overall, and yet you step up and, and win over someone like a Michael Andrew, who I think might have an inch or two on you and his arms might be a little bigger, his start might be a little more explosive, but you're, uh, you're talking about maximizing what you've got. Exactly, yeah. And, and that's very important. Um, you can't measure heart in, in, in a swimmer. That's, it's not something you, you can measure your height, you can measure your weight, you can measure how fast you swim that 50, but you can't measure how much heart a swimmer has. And that's very important, um, especially as you're closing out a race. Um, and, and that's the difference between first and second, because as you get to that level, there's nothing separating you except your, your motivations, how bad you want to win the race. So back to your body composition point, what would looking like a sprinter mean to you versus looking like a distance swimmer? I, honestly, I think it's mostly just the, the weight and that's heavily controlled in the weight room um sprinters will be doing more more heavy weights and i think distance guys would be more shoulder care um core workouts so it's, it's, it's also heavily controllable in today's situation maybe not 50 60 years ago the guys didn't really have that sort of science behind it they didn't have the the the, the same knowledge about nutrition and everything um, but I would just think the, the, the biggest difference for me between a sprinter and a distance guy is probably their, just their weight. I mean, you get tall sprinters, short sprinters, you get tall distance swimmers, short distance swimmers, long arms, short arms, short legs, long legs. Um, but I think weight and the distance you have to carry that weight is a big component of the difference. Well, if any of y'all have any more questions, throw them in the chat or send them to Megan. And I think she's been forwarding them to me so far. Zane, the last one I have for you is about underwater kicking. I think underwater kicking for a lot of kids, you have to have that aha moment. It has to click that whole undulation. Where does it start? What do my toes need to be doing? How do I kick back and forth? So I think hearing it in a million different ways might just give 
every kid a chance to have that aha moment. How would you describe the underwater kick when it's well done? I would describe it as a whip movement coming from your diaphragm. So you want to, so if you go watch a video of a whip, you can see how it kind of flicks and it has a, an opposite way movement flicking upwards. I think that's very important to create that whipping movement through your diaphragm. Your hips should be shifting backwards and forwards in the, in the direction you're kicking, of course. You shouldn't be kicking from your knees. You should be kicking from your hips downwards. If, if your quads are getting sore, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, so it's all about creating that whip action. That's what your, your, your feet should be doing. They should be relaxed, creating more of a whip motion, whip motion downwards. So I, I always envision myself as a whip, trying to create that whip-like movement through my uh, undulating from my diaphragm all the way downwards to my toes. Very nice. Okay. I like that analogy to the whip. So Indiana Jones, next time someone is on Netflix looking for a movie. This is a two-parter. I know that you would do anything to get an extra hour of sleep. So what time did you go to bed? How important was that for you? And what did you eat before morning practice, if anything, and before a meet? Do you have a favorite meal for those two situations? And what did sleep do for you? Yeah, I think sleep is very important. Um, 9.30 is usually considered a late night um, if I'm going to bed. 9 30 10 is usually considered pretty late um i do normally have a, like a protein bar or, or or a power bar before morning training um a lot of water um just so you can rehydrate after you've slept but before meat um before a big race i love to have a big breakfast maybe two hours three hours before the actual race so it has time to digest it's not sitting heavy inside of me um, but it has to be big. I'm talking two eggs, three slices of bacon, two pieces of toast, hash browns, uh, breakfast potato. I have the whole works, cup of coffee, um, because I see that as giving me the energy to go and perform as well as I can in that race. But it has to be about three hours away from the race. So otherwise, I'm going to be too heavy going in. Um, but I love a huge breakfast. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, everybody's different in that respect for sure, but it's always fun to hear about what people like to eat before uh, races. I think some people eat just a handful of berries and that's, that's what does it for them. Earlier, we've got another question here. I mentioned that you spent a long time coming in second. How did you deal with the disappointment of, of being so close and yet so far or the races where you weren't in second? I saw it as a learning opportunity because the guy beating me is obviously knows something that I don't. Um, so to learn from those guys, uh, Christian Golomir, even though he was kind of done with the team, he was graduated and everything. Uh, just speaking to him on a daily basis, learning about freestyle. I think that really improves my, like just myself as a swimmer, Luke Kalazak beating me, Connor Oslin, two legends of Alabama swimming that, I would come third and a hundred back at SECs. It'd be, they'd be one, two, and I'd probably be third or fourth. Um, so to learn from those guys and just take away what they have to, to what they know that I don't know about the stroke um, is what made me a better swimmer and helped me deal with that. Crowdsourcing some technical info on the strokes. I like that. So I don't know if coach Megan had, any other questions or anything else? This would be the last chance to get a question in from the chat. I'm looking at it right now. But this has been incredibly insightful, Zane. Thank you very much for taking time out of your Saturday right before a, a big football game to chat with us. Absolutely. And one thing I want to say is um, if any of you guys are, I don't know, I'm usually shy to ask questions uh, at something like this. But if you guys want to go and like DM me on the Instagram, um, I'll gladly answer any of your questions. I, I'm always, I try and do the, the Q and a thing on my Instagram story. I usually get questions from the four guys that I was friends with at college, but if you guys it's, I think it's at Zane Mako. I don't even know. I, I'm sure Christian will have it. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can go on there and just send me a DM. I'll, I'll probably answer it for you. If you tell me you're from, um, the zoom. Okay. Well, I, I did get I three more right here. I sent you two last ones, so. I think, yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, someone wanted to know what your fastest time was. I guess telling us your long course meters time would probably be best. And then after that, what did you eat between events? We talked about before and before a meet. Um, what do you do if you're waiting for, for hours and hours between races? What do you eat then and there? And lastly, actually answer those first two and then I'll give you the last one. Okay. Um, so my best times, um, I've been 49.0, 100 free long course. I've been 48 on the relay. 100 back has been uh, 53.82 uh, long course meters. 50 back was 24.4. That was obviously the world's one. Um, to answer the, the second question is another huge lunch. Um, if you're not feeding yourself, um, I believe that you're not going to have the energy to sustain yourself. Um, so I'd like to eat a huge lunch, just whatever there is, be it pasta um, or I don't know, just whatever they have. In normally, if we're in a village, it's just whatever they have. I'll try and eat a lot of, try a lot of carbs uh, just to get recovered. Then the third one. The third one is just wondering, I guess you talk specifics, but over time, what was it you focused on to get faster? If you could leave us with a, a little tip or thing to a soundbite to remember. Something I focused on was just trying to learn. Your coaches know a lot. All my coaches throughout the years knew a copious amount of, work, of, of stuff about swimming. So um, learning from them every day. And over time, you will learn just as much as them interacting with your teammates. Um, it's very good to have positive reinforcement and to give positive reinforcement. And then just to train hard. I mean, swimming will always be one of the hardest sports to train in. It's a grind. You're looking at the black line for majority of the time. Um, so just to stay focused and keep training as hard as you can. Awesome. Awesome. I think that this has been recorded. So we can cut and splice and take your sound bite and just play it on repeat at practice. Oh yeah. Um, Coach Megan, was there anything else that you wanted to ask Zane or tell the swimmers before we finish up? No, no, I, nothing from me. And there's no more questions here. Just thank you very much for taking the time today to talk to these guys. Um, and guys, we did tag him in on one of our Instagram posts. So you'll be able to find, his uh, link there to be able, if you do have any more questions for him, like he said, but otherwise, no, just thank you so much for taking the time to talk to the kids and Christian for being our Q and a guy. Um, it was great. So I guess this has been your uh, inaugural pro swimming Q and a AMA debut. I'm sure we'll see plenty more with, with swim swim or whoever it might be. But again, yes, as Megan said, thank you so much for, for doing this on a Saturday. And uh, I guess if that's it, then we will thank you and we will all be on our way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And don't be afraid to ask questions, please. I'm, I'm there as a resource for you guys. And uh, it's always nice to get back to the sport. Well said. All right, Megan, I'm not actually sure how to, I'm not a Zoom aficionado. I'm not Sorry. sure how to. I'll okay. stop the recording and I'll end the meeting. So it's all good. Thanks so much, guys, and have a great weekend. Uh, and we'll see you guys all on Monday. Thank you. See y'all. Have fun.